Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get our next panel started. We're thrilled that everybody is here this morning. We've just heard a tremendous amount of very dramatic and sobering data about the state of our economy. And we want this next panel to help us focus on some critical questions, looking at what this data means for, for you, for our families, for our communities. What are the implications of this data? What does it mean for poor people? What does it mean for young people? And what does this growing gap in equality mean for our society? So we've got a very exciting panel for you today to help us explore these questions. And I'd like to introduce them uh, in the order in which they will be speaking. I'm going to introduce all of them uh, and then ask each of them to uh, take their turn speaking. So I'm going to be begin with Stephen Nathanson. Stephen is a professor of philosophy here at Northeastern. He teaches courses in ethics and political philosophy, and he has a special focus on the ethics of war, economic justice, and patriotism. And he's also written widely on the topic of the death penalty. Charlotte Kahn. Charlotte Kahn is the director of the Boston Indicators Project at the Boston Foundation. The Indicators Project tracks change across a comprehensive framework of 10 sectors and each year it issues a report card tracking progress across a shared civic agenda. Catherine Eden on the end. Catherine is a professor of public policy and management at Harvard University, where her, her research focuses on urban, uh, urban, urban poverty and family life, social welfare, public housing, child support, and non-marital childbearing. Elise Cherry in the center. Elise is the CEO of Boston Community Capital, a national model for community investment, which is a, a national model for community investment, and she's the president of the Boston Community Venture Fund. She's invested more than $650 million in low-income communities and has financed more than 11,100 affordable homes. Sonia Chang Diaz is the state senator. She's the first Latina elected to the Massachusetts State Senate. She's currently in her second term, and she serves as the chair of the Joint Committee on Education. Senator Diaz is widely recognized as a strong advocate for public education, for quarry reform, and ensuring access and opportunities for low-income and immigrant communities. Christopher Jenks, Professor Jenks, uh, the second one from my, my left. Uh, Senator, professor Jenks is a professor of social policy at Harvard, his research uh, recently deals with changes in family structure over the past generation, the costs and benefits of an economic inequality, and the extent to which economic advantages are inherited, as well as the effects of welfare reform. Gia Barboza, third from my left, is an assistant professor of African American Studies here at Northeastern, and her areas of research include public health policy, health disparities, sexual violence prevention, youth violence, and bullying, and cyberbullying. She's also been teaching a course on the politics of poverty in partnership with the Boston Public Health Commission, Catholic Charities Teen Center, and Emmanuel Gospel Center. Steve Tolman, to my immediate left, has served as a state senator from 1999 until this year. He has deep labor roots. He resigned his Senate seat this last, recently in October after being elected the new president of the Massachusetts AFL-CIO. The AFL-CIO is the state's largest labor umbrella organization, representing more than 750 locals and nearly 400,000 workers in, across Massachusetts. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. And to start us off, I'm going to ask Steve, ask Steve Nathanson if he will give us some remarks. Steve? Pleasure to be here. I don't usually like to stand behind a podium, but I realize I can't juggle paper, this little gizmo, and a microphone. So, uh, <clears throat> let's see if I can. Is this going to obey me? Or <clears throat> oh yeah. Okay. So, uh, 
What I want to talk about today, so I'm a, I'm a philosopher, I'm not going to give you, I actually have one slide that has a few numbers on it, but on the whole, I won't give you data. But I want to suggest that actually a lot of the crisis that we're facing, we're all aware that we face a political crisis, an economic crisis, but I want to suggest uh, that this is also a philosophical crisis and that there are certain features of the ways in which we discuss politics in the United States that make it much more difficult to uh, support and promote the kinds of values that uh, would lead to an economically uh, just society. As a matter of fact, I seldom hear the words economic justice. Uh, even the word justice is pretty scarce these days. Uh, and I think the kind of vocabulary we use is very important in, uh, in, the, in having an impact on uh, what policies we end up with. So I want to begin um, with a, a couple of quotes from uh, President Obama from, I think this may have been his first uh, press conference, I'm not sure, February 2009, and he's responding to critics of his economic initiatives. Uh, and he points out, uh, he says, some of the criticisms of my proposal really are with the basic idea of the gov that the government should intervene at all in this moment of crisis, of economic crisis. You have some people, very sincere, I don't know why I had to say they were very sincere, but at any rate, uh, very sincere, who philosophically just think the government has no business interfering in the marketplace. And in fact, there are several who have suggested that FDR was wrong to intervene back in the New Deal. They're fighting battles that I thought were resolved a long time ago. And then another line, he says, now maybe philosophically you, don't, you just don't think that the federal government should be involved in the economy. I happen to disagree with that. I guess I want to make two points uh, using this, uh, th these quotes. On one hand, as a philosopher, I'm always happy when people say that f philosophical issues are important. So I was very happy, and I think he accurately does point out the philosophical differences that underlie a lot of our current debates. Uh, but his answers to these philosophical challenges are extraordinarily weak. So their fighting battles, I thought, were resolved a pretty long time ago. If they're still fighting these battles, apparently they weren't, and they have to be fought again. And likewise, it's not really enough to say that people philosophically oppose you and say, in reply, I happen to disagree with that. We really need something stronger uh, if we're going to do the job of supporting the initiatives that uh, the president was trying to support. Uh, <clears throat> now, one of the things that, even though Obama, for many of us, uh, has been, if you, uh, well, n not as progressive as we'd like, let's say, uh, we have to recognize that he's always uh, sort of suffering an onslaught of challenges of people who are saying that he is a socialist. So here's just a, a small sample of books that you could order, if you like, after you leave today, um, about Obama uh, and socialism and how America has to be saved from his socialism, et cetera. Uh, even in 2008, before he ever was president, this uh, picture was uh, circulating. And I think it's very uh, interesting and actually quite important that Obama is attacked uh, as a socialist. Uh, because in our political culture, socialism doesn't actually play a prominent role, but it does serve a kind of purpose as a specter, as something that we have to worry about, as some sort of foreign import that might take us over if we're not very careful. And so it becomes a smear term uh, that's used uh, politically all the time. Uh, just last week, actually, uh, Michelle Bachman, who you probably did not expect to hear quoted today, uh, said, uh, the reason President Obama and some Republicans can get behind socialized medicine is because they share the same core political philosophy about the purpose of government. And then she says, we can't, you probably saw this quote in the paper, we can't preserve liberty if the choice is between a frugal socialist and an out-of-control socialist. So not only is President Obama a closet socialist, 
But so are, I suppose, Herman Cain and Mitt Romney, Rick Perry, and these other characters. Uh, and I th again, I think it's extremely important to sort of, I mean, this is ridiculous, but to take it seriously that the, the use of this language here as a way of trashing certain kinds of proposals. And I think it also suggests that the ways in which we conceptualize these issues is very uh, primitive and, again, works against uh, progressive politics. So uh, I would say that a lot of these debates about the role of government and the economy take the form of capitalism versus socialism that, well, if we're sort of talking about these kinds of issues, there's two possible views. You can either be for capitalism, in which case you support private ownership of property, a market system of production and distribution, and a, a kind of what I call an allocation rule or principle to each according to their ability to pay plus gifts. So gifts include charity, inheritance, and other small matters. Uh, but they don't on this model, they don't include a role for the government to produce or distribute or ensure the distribution of goods to anybody. And then the alternative, socialism is, or state socialism, sort of the government taking over the economy whole hog, planning the uh, production and distribution, and distributing things to people according to need or perhaps an equal share to everybody. So the way that these debates are formed, formulated, is in terms of this rather bleak all or nothing choice. And as a matter of fact, the kind of system we have uh, is neither of them. It's a form of a welfare state or sometimes called welfare capitalism. And I've labeled this the invisible welfare state because it's really not present in the language of political debate. So when anybody, including Mitt Romney or Herman Cain, says anything about government support for some social service or, or uh, meeting people's needs, they too get branded as socialists. So I wanted to quote from a couple of, uh, these are from students of mine uh, in a course on economic justice. They often do a survey to ask people uh, what is capitalism or socialism, welfare state, and so on, and why, are pe why do people think these systems are good or bad? And I was very struck several years ago, and I'll just read the second quote here, uh, by a student who said, explaining why people didn't have very good answers about the welfare state, everyone knew what capitalism, he said, is, he said, because we live in a capitalist society, but people were unsure what a welfare state is. So here we are in a situation where we live in a welfare state, uh, but we have a market capitalist ideology. And for that reason, the welfare state is always under attack because it doesn't fit in with the political culture that, that we live in. And its fair, welfare state activities are very vulnerable to criticism, the criticism that it's socialism, among others. So uh, what we have to do, I think, among other things, is to sort of bring to the surface the idea of a welfare state, or if you want to use words like welfare capitalism, that's, that's fine, as an alternative, a third choice, uh, between pure market capitalism and socialism. We can have a primarily uh, private ownership market uh, economy, uh, but in addition, government does have a legitimate role to distribute some resources, some goods and services, if you like. Uh, and we can have a, a, a principle then uh, to each according to their ability to pay. There are a lot of things we need to have money if we go into the store to buy. Gifts are one way in which people get resources. But in addition, a legal guarantee for people of access to some resources. So that in a welfare state, there's a mix of what are called socialized and marketized uh, sectors. In a marketized sector, ability to pay is what you need to acquire something. In a socialized sector, uh, things are distributed uh, according to need. Uh, and so then the question emerges, or the key question becomes a practical question, what sorts of things should be distributed by market and what should be socialized? And I'll just give two 
uncontroversial examples, because again, these, these are things that are sort of invisible to us. Uh, somebody might say, why should anybody get anything for nothing? You should be able to pay or have to pay for what you get. But two uncontroversial socialized sectors are police protection, goes to everybody, uh, not necessarily equal in, in equal way, but nonetheless, everybody's guaranteed police protection, and K through 12 education. Those are uncontroversial uh, institutions and practices in our country, but they, uh, they're, they're not things that are determined by the market. They're alternatives to market distribution. And I don't think even Michelle Bachman, uh, Michelle Bachman would uh, criticize his, those things. I do want to quote her again, however, because uh, uh, this gives, uh, I've discovered recently she's actually interesting to at least read small bits of. Um, so here, this is from just a, a week or so ago. Food stamps, the Department of Education, the Automobile Task Force, the government take over housing, healthcare, student loan industries are all examples of the federal government doing what the Constitution did not explicitly enumerate. Government will have to diminish so that you have the power and chance to succeed and grow and so that free markets can once again be free. So notice her list here of activities and she does have a kind of constitutional argument, which I think is a bad argument, but at least she's trying to argue and not just saying, oh, well, I happen to believe this or that. Uh, and it's also interesting that she, in talking to her audience, tells people that they will have more power and a chance to succeed and grow if free markets can once again be free. I think a lot of the speakers of the last panel uh, certainly cast uh, doubt on that. Uh, I mean, showed it to be false. Uh, so one of the things I want to suggest as a kind of uh, way into thinking about these issues philosophically and also arguing more effectively for them is to think about economic justice as actually involving three kinds of components. If we ask, what is an, a just distribution of resources within the society? Who's getting taken care of, who's, who's being, whose interests are being ignored? That the first is the idea of enhancing people's well-being. Uh, Elizabeth Cohn used the phrase, benefits for all. That if the system's functioning, there should be benefits for all. Does a particular system, whether it's capitalism, socialism, or a welfare state, or one kind of welfare state versus another, uh, is it economically just? What we need to look at, and what some of our speakers have provided uh, us with, is information about how well off are people as a result of the workings of the economy and the government. The second thing that we, people we should look for is fairness, and are people getting uh, what they deserve? Are they getting opportunities that they deserve? Are they getting compensated properly for the work that they do? Are they getting things, for example, education, police protection, that one can deserve, uh, or health care, that one can deserve even if you haven't worked for them? Are there some things people deserve simply because they're human beings or citizens and don't, don't have to be uh, earned? Uh, I'll skip some data since you have those already and just, just conclude by noting what I think are some important overlaps between some of the language that comes out of the Occupy movement and the three values that I've tried to suggest are really important in evaluating how well economic systems and political systems are working. So. Uh, maximizing well-being, how can polit political leaders claim that they're promoting the general welfare when the top 1% possess an excessive share of wealth and income? What we need is a distribution of wealth and income that effectively promotes the benefits of, of all, not simply some. Second, how can we claim that people deserve their success if the playing field is skewed in their favor and other people lack the resources to compete effectively and want to work but can't find jobs? And finally, in terms of, uh, of liberty, uh, do most citizens have real political liberty if wealthy people control the political system and use it to create laws that favor them and ignore the interests of the, majority, the vast majority? What we need to cure all of these 
uh, problems is a fair democratic system of government that genuinely represents the interests of all people. Thank you very much, Steve. I'd like to now ask Charlotte Kahn from the Boston Foundation. Is, are you going to do the clicker? Oh, no, I'll do it. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm really, whoop, really hoping that we can have an emperor's clothes uh, moment here because we badly need one when it comes to health care. So the World Health Organization says that the most important determinants of health our income, social status, education, and the physical environment. Health services, while of course essential, are at the bottom. The U.S. healthcare system is upside down with profit generating treatment, research, and products at the top. And as you, as you can see, the physical environment, education, income, and social status at the bottom. Now, what does that really look like in terms of our spending? It's a, it's a mismatch between what we know about the actual determinants of health and where we put our money. So for every health dollar we spend, we're spending 88 cents on treatment uh, and access to health care services and 12% on everything else. What does that level of spending look like in terms of an economy of our size? It looks like a big, fat bubble that started in about 1976 as health care grew at a faster rate than inflation from, excuse me, from then until now, much faster than all other consumer expenditures combined. And actually, you know how much we spend? We spend as much on health care we spend half as much on health care in this country as China spends on absolutely everything. Health care costs are also rising much, much faster than workers' wages. Health insurance premium increases alone absorbed almost half of American wage increases in the decade between 1999 and 2008. So for all that spending, how's our health? Fasten your seatbelts. This is a map, as you can see, of the nation in 1997 in terms of the rate of obesity. And you can see that a couple of states are doing uh, well with obesity rates around you know, 10%, and they're kind of hovering between 15 and 22% for the rest of the uh, in all the rest of the states. Now fast forward to 2007. In just 11 years, obesity rates in the nation doubled. And only one state today has, has a level under 20%. Now obesity is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's, breast cancer, all sorts of things. Chronic preventable disease which costs about 80% of our expenditures on health care. And where is this, you know, where do we see the worst health outcomes? In counties that are disproportionately of color in the South. And we, you can see the relationship between obesity and, and diabetes, which is, an, you know, type 2 diabetes being almost entirely preventable. Now we see exactly the same picture in Boston, where High, the highest obesity rates are in Boston's neighborhoods of color. And we also see, despite all of our spending, rising rates of both hypertension and type 2 diabetes, with, with uh, increasing rates of preventable hospitalization. Now, the same correlation between income and obesity and other ills are seen in this uh, chart just showing the correlation between income and uh, obesity rates throughout greater Boston. So you can see there's a very strong correlation, as the World Health Organization told us. So we see here the nexus between geography, race, poverty, education, and health. 
The map on the left shows Greater Boston and the sort of lightish, the lightest color in the middle is that swath, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, the part of, the, of Greater Boston with the fewest white people. And you can see in the map on the right, the concentration of families receiving food stamps and public assistance. So again, an almost total correlation in this case between race and uh, poverty, but this, this next map shows the same correlation between those factors and education. So on the left, we see the lack of residents with a uh, BA or higher in the same area, and in the right, a high percentage of adults over the age of 25 with no high school diploma. Likewise, a disproportionate high rate of violence in the same uh, neighborhoods and with accompanying uh, youth homicides. So, you know, this is terrible. This is a public health crisis. So what can we do about it? Not too much. Why? Because we're spending so much on health care. This is the state budget between FY01 and FY11. And as you can see, our expenditures on health care increased by 76% at the expense of all of the actual determinants of health. Education, law and public safety, public health, higher education, environment and recreation, exactly the determinants of health. So this is, you know, what do we do? Well, the first thing we need to do is to have this emperor's clothes moment and understand that this is not a system that is focused on producing health. It's a system that is focused on producing income and profits, largely. And the National Institute of Medicine in Washington concluded recently that the U.S. healthcare system, such as it is, wastes about a third of its cost annually. So in the U.S., in 2009, that was uh, $760 billion a year wasted. If you, tr you know, extrapolate to Massachusetts, that would be $20 billion in 2009 wasted. Uh, Larry Summers just uh, last week for 2011 suggested that that number now nationally is a trillion dollars a year wasted. That is about the same level as our annual federal deficit that we're turning ourselves into a pretzel about. So the bottom line is that we need to revamp what we think of as our health care system so that it actually um, aligns with the actual determinants of health, the first things of which would be poverty alleviation, education, and the physical environment. The problem is that trends are going in the wrong direction. And this is a very scary chart, but this is the RAND Corporation, and uh, it's also um, a RAND Corporation projection that is um, aligned with the Mass Department of Public Health's projection as well that between 2010 and 2020 in this Commonwealth, our health care costs are projected to double from about uh, $65 billion a year this year, or 2010, to $123 billion in just 2020. So that's what's going to happen if we do nothing. In other words, it's a completely unsustainable, crazy number that will overwhelm our capacity to do everything else. So please wake up. The emperor has no clothes. Thank you. Catherine Eden. So this is an audience with a large appetite for bad news. And I'm going to give you some more, but uh, it better be good because I have a 16-year-old daughter in the back and I've got to keep her awake. Okay? Just waiting for the slide. I'm supposed to talk about poverty, 
Here it is. Uh, these are tables from the U.S. Census Bureau. As you can see, poverty is going up. None of you are surprised by that news. We've been inundated by that news since these numbers came out in September. We can see they're growing up especially for as African Americans and Latinos. Again, no surprise. And here, third is the number we are supposed to care most about, and that is what's happening with children. In 2010, 22% of all American children, somewhere between a fifth and a quarter, are living below a poverty line that is very, very low indeed. So that's the backdrop um, of what I'm going to tell you today. But actually, if we get underneath these numbers, there's a worrying and growing inequality within the poor. As many of you know, between 1994 and 1996, we fundamentally transformed the U.S. welfare system. We abolished something called AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, and we've replaced it with a system called TANF, which is a very small, weak, tiny program these days, as I'll show you in a minute. And in doing so, we ended the federal entitlement to assistance for poor families with children. Now, at the same time, we expanded another important program called the Earned Income Tax Credit. This is now the main U.S. welfare program. It lifts more kids out of poverty than any program in the United States. But by replacing a work-based, a welfare-based, a need-based safety net with a work-based safety net, we've, uh, we've introduced a new system of winners and losers. And in some ways, we didn't realize what we had done in the 1990s because the economy was so strong. But as we went into 2000, and especially in uh, light of the recession of 2008 and beyond, the holes in our new safety net are glaringly apparent. Now, uh, just to give you a sense of how profoundly, uh, profoundly we reformed the welfare system, this is the East Boston uh, welfare office. It's now been sold uh, to a nonprofit organization. It's a grim building with uh, wire mesh over the windows. It says overseers of the public welfare. Folks who used to claim benefits there had to face long lines and humiliating interactions with caseworkers. So this is the system we've abolished. Instead, the H&R Block is now the new welfare office. Uh, most poor folks who work get their benefits uh, in February from places like H&R Block, Taxman, and Liberty Taxes, about 60 to 70 percent of them. So instead of those humiliating days at the welfare office, you've got people. Okay? This is a picture of uh, a friendly staff of a local H&R Block where you're treated like every other American. And I would argue there are real gains for the working poor and near poor under the new system. The EITC has grown exponentially just as the welfare system has shrunk to almost non-existence, as you can see. Currently, and this is for 2012, a parent with three kids can claim almost $6,000 in one lump sum for her children a mom with two kids can claim a little over $5,000. She can, by the way, keep all of her wages, all of her child support, and still get this money. Under the old system, she would have had to choose either the 5000 bucks or the job and the child support. So this is a substantial gain in the actual amount of money poor folks who work have to spend. And as you can see, the EIDC is hugely effective in lifting kids out of poverty. We actually don't cover, uh, count it in the current poverty measure because it's after tax income, and the poverty line is based on before tax income. In 2009, kind of its peak year, it lifted 3.3 million kids out of poverty and 6.6 .6 million Americans altogether, if we had counted it. And indeed, the alternative poverty uh, measure does this. Uh, this is the way the EITC is structured. Up until about $8 an hour, the more you work, the more you get. It plateaus till about $12 to $13 an hour, and then it begins declining slowly till you hit around $40,000 a year. But not everybody is winning for, from this system because not everyone is working. This is a study done by Rebecca Blank looking at the proportion of single-parent households who are neither working nor on welfare. And we can see that between 1990 and 2007, when her analysis ended, 
a much greater share of, of folks, single mothers, raising dependent children, were living with no visible means of support. And what I'm going to show you next is work that Luke Schaefer and I have been doing to update some of these numbers. Now, the tables you're going to see are a little bit different than the ones Rebecca Blank uh, prepared. First of all, we look at all households, not just single mothers. Second, we look at households, not families. If we were to look at families, we would see a much bleaker story because families who are doubled up in households don't get counted as either poor or having no cash income in most cases. So this is a conservative story. We're using the survey of income and program participation, and we're taking a monthly view. So the question we're trying to ask with these tables is, how is the safety net responding to the recession and its jobless recovery? How well are we doing? Okay, beautiful table, a little bit confusing. Uh, the breaks are because uh, there are different SIP panels, and if you're interested in that, I can answer that in Q&A or uh, preferably one-on-one. -on -one. It's a little boring. But what you might notice first are the red lines and the blue lines. What the red line shows is that the proportion of households with at least one person covered by some form of public insurance this is Medicaid or SCHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program, has increased dramatically over time. Currently, 75% of all poorest households with children, that's our universe here, are getting some form of public insurance. You might also notice the blue line on the bottom. This is the percent of folks who are claiming anything, anything from cash welfare over time. And you can see that decline is very dramatic. Public housing is flat during this period. That's because we've torn down some buildings and we've added some vouchers, but we really haven't done much to assist uh, the, the uh, housing burden poor at all. And then you see the green line, which is most, this is food stamps, or SNAP, uh, which is most responsive to that. Uh, it goes down a lot during the economic recovery of the late 1990s and then up again pretty dramatically all the way through 2009. But this is the more interesting table. Here, the red line is the proportion of the sample who has less than a dollar a day to live on. A dollar a day. This is for the household. If any of you know about international uh, poverty estimates, this used to be the threshold per individual in third world countries. Now I think it's two and a half uh, dollars a day, something like that. But this is a very, very low number. And by the way, we have no real idea how these folks are doing. During the years examined, the proportion of what we call the cashless poor more than doubles from between 7 and 8 percent to between 16 and 18 percent. This is an increase from about a half a million households in 1996-1997 to about 1.2 seven million households in 2009. Now, it is true that as the proportion of cashless poor grows, the proportion with no income but some food stamps, some public health insurance also grows. Okay, so that's good news. Uh, in some ways, our safety net is doing a little. The cashless poor with a non-cash safety net represent about 3% of all households in poverty in 1997-1998, and about 10% in 2009. So about 1 in 10 households in poverty have no income but to subsist on SNAP or some public health insurance. This is a change from about 1,800 families in the earlier period to about 750,000 households in 2009. Now, as I said before, it's somewhat comforting that half of households in poverty who are cashless poor are on SNAP or public health insurance. But half are not. Half are not. Now, how responsive is our, what remains of our shredded safety net, these non-cash programs, to the kinds of things that drive cyclical poverty? the income shocks that are so important above and beyond the recession. First of all, job loss, and second, changes in family structure. As you'll see, this is uh, for uh, when the head of household loses a job. The answer is not very much. 
Same for family structure. And look at the paltry performance of our TANF system. This is our cash welfare system, or what's left of it, in both cases. So let's think back to the winners for a minute, because I've just given you some hint about what might be going on with the losers. And these are all households with children, so we should be really concerned about them. But what about the winners, people who are both able to work and keep a job and collect that 5000 bucks from the EITC? We've been doing research in both the Boston area and in uh, Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and what we've found is that these folks aren't doing so well either. They can't live on their wages alone. So they go into debt every month. By the time the EITC comes in one lump sum in February, they're often desperate, and a very large share of the EITC, which we were hoping could be used for folks to build assets and save and reverse the kind of dynamics that Tom Shapiro talked about, are actually going to pay off back bills and old debt. Thank you. Catherine, thank you very much. Elise? Elise Cherry. Good morning. I'm going to uh, give you a moment's break from all of the dismal charts that we've been seeing about uh, a little bit of myth and culture at the moment. Um, as Bob indicated earlier, I am a practitioner. Um, I am CEO of Boston Community Capital, and we have been around for 27 years now trying to help build healthy communities where low-income people live and work. Another way to describe what we're doing is to really talk about enhancing capital inflows to low-income communities. And particularly what I want to talk about this morning is a piece of work we're doing with respect to foreclosure relief. Not so much because I want to go through the details of that, but really because I want to use it to articulate some of the issues that we're finding with respect to the foreclosure crisis and its impact in the economy as a whole. So to just give you a couple of uh, sentences about what we're doing, we are basically bringing folks in who are either late in their mortgages, live in Massachusetts, or in foreclosure, underwriting them just the way everybody always got underwritten prior to about 2003 or 2004. And if, in fact, people can support a mortgage at a current market price, that is not the bubble price that everybody bought at, but a current market price, we then go out to the lender or, if it's post foreclosure, to the real estate-owned uh, inventory manager um, and attempt to buy that home back. And then we sell it right back to the homeowner with a 30-year fixed-rate mortgage. Now, there are lots and lots of bells and whistles attached to this thing, which I won't go into this morning. But the, the, the goal here really is to stabilize neighborhoods. We've named the program SUN for stabilizing urban neighborhoods because the idea is really to go beyond the individual household or family and really think about this as a neighborhood on a neighborhood perspective. But what we're trying to do is to keep people in their homes. And so I wanted to talk for a minute about some of the impediments that we're running into because I think that they really uh, elucidate what's going on in the economy today. So you might imagine we're providing uh, fixed rate mortgages, you might think that we're having trouble finding money for those mortgages. No, we're not. We actually have enough funds in from that we've borrowed from high net worth individuals and foundation support and so forth to actually make all of the mortgages that we can, that we can manage. Um, you might think that we have trouble getting people in the door. Not the case. Lots of people know about us. Lots of people come in. We actually are also able to underwrite lots of people in a way that actually means that they could afford a mortgage that we can provide. Operations, any new entity operations are always a challenge. But that's not the issue either. The real issue is the response of the mortgage industry. For lots of folks, particularly if they're late in their mortgages, that is that they're not yet through foreclosure, what we need to do is to go out to the mortgage lender and say, we'd like to buy back this mortgage. Now, it's not that we're asking them to give us a discount beyond the discount that they would have to provide to any market purchaser. We're really saying we're prepared to buy the mortgage at a current market price. I'll tell you, that turns out to be about a 42% reduction in the overall principal amount of the mortgage and actually in monthly housing expenses as well. But that's what's happening in our neighborhoods. In fact, prices are down that far. And so we say, we have an appraisal. We really want to buy it at a current market price. 
And often what we get back from the lender, and I don't want to, to paint uh, with too broad a brush here, but this is a very, very significant problem. What we hear is, okay, we'll sell to you at that price, but now you have to sign an affidavit that says you'll never sell back to the homeowner. You say, well, wait a minute, that's not going to work. That's our program. We're trying to sell back to the homeowner. That's explicitly our initiative. Our goal here is to keep people in their homes. Why on earth, if in fact we're prepared to provide you with exactly the same amount of money that you would get selling it to a third party, are you unwilling to sell it to the homeowner? And the answer that we get back often is this thing called moral hazard. Now, you know, uh, there's a lot to be said about industries living in glass houses who shouldn't be throwing stones. But that's actually not my point today. My point today is really much more about, um, first, whether this idea of moral hazard exists, and second, what it's doing to us as a country. So we heard this and heard this and heard this, and finally we thought, I think we need to go take a look and see if this really exists, because the idea of moral hazard is that if you help people who are late on their mortgages or in foreclosure, then Everybody else who's out of, who's, whose mortgages are underwater, that is, their homes are worth less than the amount of their mortgage, will stop paying. And if you talk, and I talk sometimes uh, offline to my friends in the mortgage industry, and they will tell you things like 10% of their borrowers are in foreclosure, but 40 more percent are substantially underwater, and they will do anything on earth to hive off, as they say, the folks who are actually later in foreclosure from the folks who aren't in foreclosure yet, but are underwater in their mortgages. So we started to take a look. There are lots of studies about lots of things out there. But you know what? We couldn't find any credible study that tended to suggest that people who are, that helping people who are late in their mortgages or in foreclosure actually has any impact at all on people who are simply underwater. It just doesn't exist. And so we went out and started to talk about that with folks. And it's as though I've suddenly started speaking a foreign tongue. You can say those things, but nobody hears it. I mean, you say it and they just keep going on just exactly the way they went on before you said it. Then sometimes what you hear is, oh, you know, if we hadn't had to make uh, community, community Reinvestment Act investments, we would be really fine. But the truth of it is, there's been $4 billion of Community Reinvestment Act investments in the last number of years. You know what the loss rate on that is? well under 3%, right? Better than almost anything else. I can't get that point across either. It just doesn't register. I mean, you say it, and it simply doesn't register. We're so busy living in myth that we've really lost sight of the reality, right? And then the third piece of it that you really see often is we get people who are talking about deserving homeowners. Now, Deserving homeowners, it's pretty hard to even understand what that concept is. And I've really concluded that we seem to be much more comfortable describing uh, an economic crisis as a morality play as opposed to a systemic problem, right? So that if you're focusing on deserving homeowners, I don't even know how that's supposed to work. Do you go down the street and you say, well, this one is and this one isn't? I mean, even if you could make that distinction, which we could have a debate about, I would argue that it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. If you think about a street with 10 different families who are either late on their mortgage or in foreclosure, we are not benefited by saying three of them deserve help and seven of them don't. Because this issue is not a moral issue. It is not um, even an individual family or household issue, although certainly individual families and households are an extremely important piece of it. It really is an issue about neighborhood and community and about what it is that we're going to do to, to, to save the neighborhoods and communities that so many people have now spent better than three decades really trying to bring back. So if you take that example of 10 families on a street, the neighborhood is not benefited because somebody decides that three of those families deserve help and seven don't. Because the truth of it is, when you have families in foreclosure and when those homes become vacant, every other house in the surrounding area begins to lose value as well. And so to the extent that you just think about it, the industry, the mortgage industry thinks about it as an individual, is this family deserving problem, it completely underestimates the overall sense of how much this crisis is actually costing us and where those measures should be. And I just want to talk about that as well for a moment. We are hearing a lot today about 
principal reduction. Is principal reduction good? Is it bad? Laurie Goodman has made, has made a, a very compelling article. She's one of the folks, an analyst in the mortgage industry, to say that unless we can bring people down to about 120 or 125 percent in terms of where their mortgage is versus the, 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 the value of their homes, people, in fact, will stop paying their mortgages. And there is some evidence about that as you get really, really low uh, in terms of, it, we used to call it loan to value. I guess it's, it's something, it's reversed now, right? I mean, so that the loan is greater than the value of the home. So, so that's an issue. But then you have, for example, the Federal Housing Finance Agency, which is the conservatorship for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And they, responding to Congress, and you know, we can all take some, some guesses about who Congress is responding to, have said, principal reduction, over our dead body, right? And so as a result, you've got all of these folks in the mortgage industry making a variety of arguments about why principal reduction doesn't make any sense and why it is that we really need to be focused not on the economics of the crisis, but actually on this question of individual family members or individual households and whether in fact they're deserving. So, and then there's another issue as well, which is, Sometimes what you get is a lender, a Bank of America, or a Wells Fargo, or a Citibank who says, well, all right, as to the mortgages on my books, I'm perfectly happy to deal with you around principal reduction, and we, in fact, today have a pilot going with Bank of America on just that point. But most of the mortgages that were made in this country in the last number of years actually got sold out into securitized pools. And I always say, you know, it is the absolute capitalist dream, right? You take your fee along the way so that you privatize the reward and then you pass along the risk to somebody else. Privatized reward, socialized risk. It's perfect, right? And in fact, all of us have got that risk. I mean, anybody who's got a dime in the market has really got some piece of that risk. So, so now you say, all right, well, all these mortgages are out in securitized pools, but they're being managed by the same folks who've got loans in their own portfolios. And so if you look at the registry of deeds, you can find a lot of things there, but you might, for example, see that a loan is listed in the name of Wells Fargo. You call up Wells Fargo, they say, oh no, that's not really our loan. Really, we're just servicing that loan. That loan belongs to a pool. You say, well, okay, but you are the servicer. Why don't you deal with me about uh, uh, selling me back this loan, essentially, right? And they say, oh no, we can't do that. And you say, well, this makes no economic sense. The, the borrower isn't paying. If you have to go through foreclosure, there are an enormous set of costs associated with that. It now takes, in Massachusetts, uh, roughly 450 days to go from default to eviction. You're not going to be collecting money in all that period of time. You're going to have to, once you take ownership of the property, you're going to have to pay taxes and maintain it and provide insurance on it. As an economic matter, this makes no sense whatsoever. Why not cut the losses today and move forward? Well, there are a couple issues around that. One is that it is unclear that the servicing agreements actually provide the authority to do that. Now, you might argue they don't, that they don't prohibit doing it, but in fact, the mortgage industry has gone from being profligate to being so conservative that they can't take any risk at all. And so they seem to be unwilling to take the risk of actually doing something that isn't explicitly authorized by the servicing agreement. Second piece of the problem is they make more money as a servicer while the home uh, is, is in difficulty, while the loan is in difficulty that they would not make once the loan is sold. So there are a couple of impediments there to actually anybody doing anything. So we said, okay, there's a way to solve some of this stuff, not the question of the fact that you make more money while it's in difficulty, but certainly the other issue. What we said was you could create a safe harbor for, for services to say, so long as you have backup with respect to the fact that you're getting market value for this home, you're immune from suit from the various investors. And then what you could do is create, the investors then may have a fight about where the cash actually goes once this property changes hands. You can set up an escrow for that, put the cash into the escrow, and have the investors fight forever if they want, but in the meantime at least, the market is clearing. So we sent off a, a guy who actually heads the securitization practice at McDermott, Will and Emery, to go talk to the American Securitization Forum about just that. What happened? They came back and said, oh, we couldn't possibly do that. The answer, why? Moral hazard. So, so we've now gone completely full circle. And I know I've just got a moment left here, so let me just make one suggestion about what I think needs to happen, okay? Whether we're talking about modification programs or programs like the Sun Initiative or anything actually that is going to sort out the foreclosure crisis, I think what we need to have are three factors. One is we've got to reduce monthly housing expense. That seems apparent, and some of the existing uh, modification programs do exactly that. The second thing is 
any initiative that gets going has got to be able to put a floor under housing prices. We've got to be able to stop the downward spiral of housing prices. And the third thing is that homeowners need to be homeowners not just in name but in practice. And what that means is they've got to be able to get close to equity in their homes, if not today, then in the foreseeable future, so that they actually act in the way that homeowners act, maintain the home, repair the home, and in fact contribute to the stability of their neighborhoods. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elise. Really appreciate it. Senator Chang Diaz. Good morning, everyone. All right, you're still awake. Um, I, uh, before I sort of dive into the weeds, I, I just want to pause and, and kind of step back here for a moment because I feel like we're probably all sinking down into our seats, you know, lower and lower. It's, it's a lot of depressing news, and, but important um, news and facts to talk about. But I just want to offer a little reflection, if I can, as I, I, as I look out um, at my colleagues on the panel and uh, at the audience that's with us today, I, it gives me a little shot in the arm uh, in the face of all of these statistics. I see, you know, I don't know everyone in this audience, but I see just, you know, people that I know are doing incredible, incredible work in our city, in our state. Elise Cherry is doing incredible work in my district that I'm so thankful for. Um, you know, I see people like Karin and Tim Ferguson who are out there toiling in the vineyards every day to keep City Air working, to keep um, the Pine Street Inn working, to make small businesses grow. Uh, in our disadvantaged neighborhoods. Uh, so I just, you know, and, and there's so many more people like that in the audience. So I just want to pause and sort of have you guys look around and take hope uh, in the colleagues that are here with you today. And, and a round of applause for all the good work that people are doing. So uh, my name again is Sonia Chang Diaz, and I'm the state senator for the second Suffolk district here in Boston. Um, it is a it is an awesome, awesome district. It runs from Chinatown on the northern end to Mattapan on the southern end. Um, in between, it includes um, the Back Bay, Beacon Hill, South End, Mission Hill, Fenway, Jamaica Plain, Roxbury, Dorchester, and again to Mattapan. And uh, I I love representing this district because it. Um, includes the wealthiest households in the state and it also includes the poorest households in the state. So I really have uh, a front row seat to exactly the polarization of wealth uh, dynamics that we see going on, you know, in, in every slide that you've seen today. And, and I don't, I don't love that because I don't, you know, I don't love representing that district because I love see, seeing that happen, but I love representing that district because it um, keeps me very focused on uh, that dynamic and it does not allow me to just pay attention to one end or the other end um, and see them in isolation, but I really get to see those things happening um, in tandem with, with one another. Um, the question that, that our panel is presented with today is, is who is the system working for and who is it failing? Uh, and I think the answer, of course, is very apparent uh, to all of us here that uh, the system sure is not serving uh, and in fact failing uh, the poor, the working poor, uh, and also the middle class. Uh, but I most particularly want to talk about children as the chair of the, uh, of the Education Committee in the legislature. As many of you probably saw in the, um, in the Globe this past week, uh, the headline about poverty worsening in the hub. And it talked about the very neighborhoods that I represent, that in Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan, we now have 42% of our children living in poverty. And when you consider the fact that that's marked uh, by the federal poverty line, which I believe is $22,000 for a family of four these days, you know, what kind of bleepity bleep is that, right? Uh, you know, that we have 42% of our children living in poverty. It's a, a statistic that even shocks me when I read it, and I, and I live it every day. So, uh, and I see this uh, front and center, in particular, in my work to fortify uh, and arm our public school system for the work that we ask them to do uh, every year and every day with our students. We've seen, and, and I know that um, I hope you'll probably see more slides to this effect when you hear from the Mass Budget uh, Policy Center later on. Um, wait, till, well, wait till Noah Berger gets up here. He's going to blow your hair back. Um, but just, you know, just a few quick and dirty stats. We see that in the last uh, 10 years, 
that education spending on our K-12 education system has declined 8%. And that's really the best statistic I have to offer because, as you heard before, K-12 education is one of the least controversial um, areas. But even in that least controversial area where there's a general recognition that um, resources should be distributed on the basis of need, uh, and not on the ability to pay, we still see a decrease over time, over the last 10 years, of 8%. 46% uh, decrease in local aid to cities and towns, a huge chunk of which also goes to fund our public school systems. 25% decrease in early education and care. These are all controlled for inflation. 32% um, decrease in higher education funding. At the same time, uh, or roughly the same time period, we've seen an increase in state expenditures, and those are all state-level expenditures. I'm trying to stay focused on the piece I'm responsible for. Uh, at the same time, we've seen a 35% increase in spending on a category that we term economic development. Now, of course, I don't think anyone here would argue that we should stop spending on economic development. It's an important part of our recovery economically. But the question is, what gets packed into that category of economic development? And is it more of powerful, is it of a lever uh, for our state than investing in, for example, K-12 education? And I would argue there's a lot in there that if you look really drill down at the effectiveness, does not stack up um, competitively against investments in our K-12 education system. And this all, again, you know, it's statistics. It's numbers, but it gets back again to, the, to that very alarming fact that 42% of our children in Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan are living in poverty. And this gets back to the question, again, of who is our system failing? And it's very clear to all of us that it's failing our poor, our working poor, our middle class, and our children. But I would argue, and I suspect I'll find many people in this room who agree with me, that our system is failing America. Our system is failing ourselves, it's failing America. Our core belief uh, as Americans, if there's anything that we, you know, that we can find a common cause and common ground on, even you know, in this time of highly polarized debate uh, and partisanship, I think is equality of opportunity, right? We can fight all day long about equality of outcomes, uh, but I hope and pray we can still find agreement over equality of opportunity. And of course, our K-12 education system um, and not just K-12, early education included, is our best tool, our best lever for delivering on that value of equality of opportunity. And we are cannibalizing and eroding our ability to deliver on that promise of equality of opportunity when we see poverty at 42% among children and when we see investments in K-12 education going down over the last 10 years. Uh, and and I, I'll just give a, another sort of in the trenches personal example of this. Um, as a state senator and as education chair, one of the things that I um, am working and fighting tooth and nail on this session is a bill um, to address our dropout crisis here in Massachusetts. Every year in Massachusetts, we lose about 8,000 students across the state uh, who walk out the door of their high schools. And at that's 8,000, in, in fact, it's gone down a tiny bit. It used to be 10,000. So, you know, we're making steps in the right direction, but still, 8,000 last year, 8,000 this year, 8,000 next year, 8,000 the year after that, and the year after that, it starts to add up. And that's what's going to happen if we don't change anything. And those students don't just go away, right? They don't just kind of fade to black. When they drop out of our school system, more often than not, they're going to show up in our criminal justice system. They're going to show up in our shelter system. They're going to show up in our substance abuse and treatment system. All of, it, in all of those places are places where they're going to cost vastly, vastly more than we spend in our public education system. So I'm working on this dropout prevention bill. And without fail, the first question that I get uh, from all of my colleagues, and you know, I can't fault them for this because I would probably ask the same question given the landscape that we're dealing with right now, but it nonetheless is the culture that the first question that everyone asks is, how much is this bill going to cost? And it tends to be a conversation stopper. Uh, not because it has an astronomical price tag attached to it. We did some costing out, looking at a model uh, for the biggest um, the biggest cost driver in this bill would be a coach program that would match coaches one-on-one -on -one with students who are at risk of dropping out. Uh, this is a program that has been implemented in the state of Georgia for the last few years with great results to show for it. And we did some back-of-the-envelope math. Per pupil in the state of Georgia shakes out to about $500 a year. 
uh, when you compare that with the 46, 47, 48 thousand dollars a year we're spending um, per head on our prisons, it's a pretty good deal, right? It's a pretty good deal. Um, but nonetheless, it ends up being a conversation stopper when we get to that question of how much is it going to cost. Uh, and so this is, this is the fight that we are fighting in order to preserve equality of opportunity for uh, not just our kids, but for our, our nation. Uh, and I, I, would, if I'm, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say our national soul. Um, and I would also just add here as a, as a penultimate note that um, I think the system is also failing our wealthy. Uh, and I, you know, in, in theory you see the slides up here uh, that uh, the top 1% or the top 5%, wherever you cut the line, are doing great under this system. Um, and that may be true in theory, and that may be true financially. But as I said at the beginning, I represent a district that also includes many of the wealthiest households in the state. And when I'm knocking on doors on the campaign trail in Back Bay and Beacon Hill, um, the question that I get from voters in those neighborhoods of my district is not, uh, what are you going to do to the tax code to make sure that I keep making more money? The question is, Sonia, what are you going to do about youth violence? I hate waking up in the city every, you know, every few weeks and seeing a story about another shooting. What are you doing about affordable housing in our city? I'm really concerned about that. And so I also would just encourage you to take heart to know that um, there are many good-hearted people out there in the 1% and in the 5% who the, si the system is also failing, um, and they can see it too. Um, if I have, how am I doing on time, Bob? One minute. All right. I'm going to give you a speed tour through some things that you can do because uh, I don't want to leave you feeling hopeless. And there are things, there are vehicles in the state house as well as on the federal level. But again, I'm going to focus on the state level. Um, one is another bill that I'm working on because I know that I can't solve the education problem without looking at the revenue side of the ledger. Uh, so one is a bill that I've proposed called an act to invest in our communities, which would um, hold on to your hats, raise the, uh, per the income tax rate in Massachusetts, would actually restore it to where it was um, previously at 5.95% instead of 5.3%. But then it would also raise the personal exemption um, enough to basically hold down increases for, uh, for low-income and middle-income families. Um, and it would also uh, raise the rates on unearned investment income, but again, provide an exemption, an exemption for seniors who depend on their investment income for their retirement savings. Um, so that's one. That's Senate 1416. I just am going to speed through these, but I want you to know that there are real solutions in place right now and we really need your help in the state house you know people always say oh I know when I just email my state senator or my state rep it goes into the trash bin or it goes into the ether and I'm here to tell you personally that if I get two emails three emails four emails on an issue I am paying attention to it last session I got some emails on an issue about um, putting a bittering agent in antifreeze who's ever heard of that Certainly not me when I ran for office, um, but it turns out a lot of my constituents cared about it, so I got educated on it, and we actually voted on it and passed it um, to, to um, keep uh, pets from eating antifreeze and poisoning themselves. Anyways, uh, so that's one bill, Senate 1416, an act to invest in our communities. Another couple bills, Senate 153. It's not my bill. It's a fantastic bill proposed by one of my colleagues, Senator Jamie Eldridge from Acton. It's an act to promote... Thank you. Yes, the man deserves a round of applause. <laughs> um, an act to promote efficiency and transparency in economic development. This gets to that point I was saying earlier about that 35% increase in economic development spending in the state. Let's look at the numbers. Let's ask each corporation that's getting a subsidy from the state to report back, how'd you do? What did you do for the state with those numbers? How many jobs did you create? Were they good living wage jobs? And if you didn't live up to your promises to the state, you have to give back the money on a prorated basis. Um, Senate 304 and 305 an act relative to disclosure of political spending. Um, these are bills that are designed to fill in, the, fill in uh, to strengthen the state's um, campaign finance laws in the wake of the Federal uh, Citizens United decision. Because as one of my colleagues on the panel said earlier, if we don't have a political system uh, that is owned by and responsive to the little guys um, who aren't making, you know, thousand and multi-thousand and million dollar campaign contributions um, and political advertising buys, um, then the rest of this is for naught. So we've got to make sure our campaign finance system um, is built in a way that is going to cause all elected officials to be responsive to the largest number of people. So again, that's Senate 304 and Senate 305. Um, please don't give up your voice. I, I expect everyone in this room is already voting. If you're registered to vote, please raise your hand. Good. If you showed up to vote on Tuesday, please raise your hand. 
Could be better. <laughs> Pretty good, but could be better. Um, please don't forget, and don't forget to use your email and your phone lines to make your senators and reps do what you want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Chan Diaz. Thank you. Professor Jenks? Professor Christopher Jenks. Well, let me begin by saying something that um, most of you have probably already noticed. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, I get a little, here's my little gizmo. Um, we spent quite a lot of time on the statistics about inequality, so I am going to move quickly past those and go to, um, whoop, that was backwards. What's happening here? Can I make this go backwards? Oh, here. Yeah. There we are. I wanted to start by saying something about the rise of inequality, which in a way is just echoing what Kathy Eden said, but um, there are really two eras in the last 30 years in which um, inequality has risen, and it's risen for different people and with different results. And we tend to be now, as the 1% um, versus 99% um, discussion suggests, focused on the more recent era. That's the American way. Um, and it is definitely worth focusing on a lot. But there was a huge increase in inequality before that, which we've now managed mostly to forget about, and that was inequality among parents. The income gap between high-income parents and low-income parents roughly doubled between 1969 and 1989. Um, that ratio went from about four and a half to about nine or 10, somewhere in there. There's a lot of measurement issues, but let's just tell them, say it's a, it was a huge change. That gap stopped rising after 1992, and lots of people gave a big sigh of relief and said, oh, well, it stopped rising. Let's stop worrying. Um, that's madness, um, because it didn't start falling. It's just leveled off at where it was in about 1992, at twice the level that prevailed when most of the people in this room were growing up. Um, and it has had really bad effects in lots of different ways. Now, I don't want to spend lots of time on that, but if you look at what's happened to college attendance, at what's happened to test scores, you see this big opening up of differences by parental income, and it's not unrelated to the fact that the income gap between the top of the parental income distribution and the bottom of the parental income distribution has widened. That's not all of it. It's also because we've changed the political system in ways that make money more important for every parent, especially the system of higher education where tuition has risen faster than the incomes of most parents, but not the top quintile of parents. And that has had all kinds of unwanted effects. But you see the same thing in high school test performance where money per se is not critically important, but where there's been a big increase in residential segregation by income, but the income inequality disparities have risen. That may explain some of the reasons why the test score disparities have risen, but they too have gone way up. Um, so I wanted to draw your attention to that and then move on to um, the question the implicit question is, well, what could you do about that? And that brings us to the second era of rising inequality, which is um, the one that started in the late 80s and kept going at least till 2007. I wish I could tell you what's happened since 2007 about this, but the data aren't really available for the top 1%. Um, but what happened then was, as I said, the rise in inequality among parents leveled off and the rising share of income going to the top 1% took off, 
which had been, it had been fairly level for the first part of this period. And then in the late 80s, that began to climb very fast. Um, and it's more or less, if you look at after tax, if you look at pre-tax income, it's roughly doubled. If you look at income after taxes, it's only gone up 75%, but um, you know, it's not, it's quite staggering to me at least. Um, the, um, so what's the story here? What, why do, what do we need to care about? Well, the rising income share of the top 1% is the political grist that is driving everything else at this point. Um, that is, if you want to make a change in policy, you have to change the politics of either a state legislature or the United States Congress or um, a city hall. City halls are mostly always broke, so they're um, a tougher um, nut to crack. But um, when you raise the share of income going to the top, you make it possible for people at the top to spend a lot more money on making sure that they keep their income. And if you ask yourself, um, what does that do? Well, we saw earlier one thing that it does. Um, as the share goes up, um, the pressure to lower tax rates also goes up because that makes it easy to hang on to your money. Um, I gave a um, talk once at Yale and discovered that the person who had endowed the lecture I was giving was um, sitting next to me at dinner. And um, I said, why do you suppose that everybody now is so interested in making money when you and I went to school, nobody from Yale or Harvard wanted to get rich. They became doctors and lawyers and they went to graduate schools to become professors and they went into public service. And 10% of my classmates were interested in going into business or Wall Street. What's happened? And he said, oh, that's easy. We lowered taxes and now people can see that they can get rich. It didn't used to be that you could get rich. The top tax rate was 80%. If you have to pay 80% to the government, it's very hard to persuade somebody to pay you enough money to be really rich if they have to pay you five times that amount of money um, for you to get rich. But now they only have to pay you two times that amount of money, one and a half times that amount of money. Now there's a chance. Um, well, that has changed the motivations of lots of people, the social norms governing our country as well as the actual distribution of income. Now, there are a lot of stories about what's gone on as the causes of rising inequality, and I would say two things to bear in mind here. One is, remember that this is a phenomenon largely confined to the United States and the United Kingdom. It is not happening in all rich countries. So explanations that dwell only on globalization of the economy, world trade, um, technology, and all of that, don't take you very far. Um, there has been some increase in some other countries, but nothing like what's happened in the United States and Britain. Oh, in Canada. And Canada has the problem that they have the same market for executives as we do. So when we raise salaries, they have to raise salaries or they lose people. Um, so let me walk quickly past that because we looked at it before and just bring your attention to one crucial factor in this run up because it illustrates perfectly the circular nature of this political interaction, namely deregulation of banking and the financial sector. That was the biggest single identifiable factor in the run-up of top 1% incomes. It's not the only factor. Um, part of it comes from the fact that people in other jobs have become more preoccupied with how to make more money, particularly lawyers and doctors. Some of it comes from the fact that CEOs get paid more because they have to keep up with their banker friends at the club. Um, and the weakness of unions makes it harder to curtail their income growth. But 
We don't know what effect that run-up had. It was allegedly supposed to make the economy more productive if we used our money more wisely. Um, there's no evidence as far as I can see that it made the economy more productive, although everybody who benefited from it um, is insistent that that was the case. But if you look for concrete evidence, it's very hard to find. There's a little bit of evidence. I've even written a paper that contributes a little bit of evidence. But if, if the effect was as small as the paper I wrote found, you would not be persuaded that you should pay any attention to this. Um, the one thing we know for sure is that at the end of this bubble, um, this change in the financial sector had a catastrophic effect on the economy. And that's what we've been talking about this morning, really. Um, so on net, I would say we know this was a bad idea. And we also know that very little has been done to prevent it happening again. I don't know how often this has to happen before somebody is willing to do something about it. But if you think about this as a political problem, the answer may be there is no number of times that this can happen that will persuade the um, legislators who depend on rich people for their um, support to vote against getting reelected. Um, the last thing I want to say is we forget how important the rich are in shaping public opinion as well as contributing to campaigns. I think that actually the shaping of public opinion is way more important. Most of the evidence suggests that if you spend lots and lots and lots of money, you might swing four or five percent of the votes. Well, that's not nothing, but it's not enough to explain what's happened in the last 30 years in the United States. Most of the things that matter are things that change the way we think about stuff. Fox News is more important than campaign contributions. And that change um, has had two prongs. One was to legitimate inequality. And that more or less, if you look at public opinion polls, has failed. That is, the percentage of people who think that the income distribution is too unequal was about two-thirds 25 years ago, and it's still about two-thirds. But it doesn't matter that two-thirds of the public thinks that income is too unequally distributed, because when you ask people, what, about, what do you think the government should do any, about that? They are universally opposed to the government doing anything. Well, if you don't want the government to do anything about it, it's kind of not very doesn't matter much what you think about how unequal a distribution of income is, because government is the only thing that is going to be able to do anything about this. And the demonization of the government has gone a long way. So that is my bottom line. Whether there's any way to reverse this, I don't know. Um, six months ago, I would have said no. Maybe I should be more optimistic now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jenks. Professor Barbosa. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for letting me be here to talk to you about the importance of youth employment for creating and sustaining social change. I should tell you that I'm not going to be talking about just providing youth with a job, but a comprehensive employment experience that's part of a comprehensive solution to end youth violence. Um, and I also want to say that before I began this research for the past year and a half, I didn't really believe or think that youth jobs was really that important of an issue, even though I have six children myself and three teenagers. But boy, am I convinced that it really can be, if done correctly, something that youth really benefit from and is part of what we're talking about here today. Okay. So first I'd like to set the national stage and give you some data on youth employment, then discuss my research from a local valuation that's a community-based participatory project 
that was a part of a summer jobs experience to understand how a job can be part of creating pro-social skills and perhaps eliminating negative and risky behaviors among high school students and then draw some conclusions about the benefits of youth employment based directly from the research findings. First, I think the jury's back. Uh, Low-income youth are less likely to be enrolled in school and more likely to be disconnected, that is, neither enrolled in school nor employed, than are um, white youth of similar ages and high-income youth. Youth living in poverty, interestingly, are more likely to be working if one or both parents are not working. The same is not true for high-income youth. Overall, young black males fare worse across all socio-demographic groups. For example, among 16-year-old black males, only 15 in 100 are likely to be employed. Black males living above the poverty line are as likely to be working as whites living below the poverty line, irrespective of gender. In this context of high youth unemployment, the State Street Initiative in conjunction with the city and other fundraisers fund fund and stakeholders decided to support an initiative to address the problem of youth violence through a summer jobs experiment. And my role was to implement a research methodology to evaluate the role of youth employment on developmental outcomes. I'd like to set the context of the neighborhood in which these youths are living first, particularly in terms of labor force attachments, education, and high violence. So the next few slides provides a brief overview of these living conditions. As was said before, about 40% of youth are living below the poverty line. But if we consider youth from low-income families where incomes are about 200% of the poverty line, that number raises to about 60%. One in every 2.5 males in this community does not have a high school education, and one, point, one out of every four females does not have a high school education. The majority of youth are living with single parents, that is in single parent households, and interestingly, if you are a youth who lives with their father only, that father is unlikely to be employed. This is not true of youths living in single parent households where the parent is a female. And importantly, this is a community of youth that has been devastated by violence. When I ask youth in a variety of focus groups the very neutral and somewhat vague question, describe your community, the responses that I get back are a depiction of crime, deviance, and violence. And the chart you see on the right here is a map of the concentration of homicides surrounding the high school that most of these youths attend. 40% of the homicides in 2010 took place within a mile and a half of this high school. Now, I ask the youth, what do you think causes youth violence? And the top three answers are boredom and not having a job, not having anything to do, money, lack of empathy and lack of community, and then guns and drugs. As well, Importantly, relationship issues come up as very important, not having access to education, and negative socialization that is not coupled with positive socialization experiences. So you can see that there are several ways to address this problem, but what I'm going to be arguing with you right here today is that workforce development is a key leverage point for change. The reason is because in terms of providing access to these other indicators such as mentorship, which is, has a known relationship to mitigating youth violence, family support and mental health, conflict resolution and skill building, creating organizational capacity and public awareness and public policy, all of these things can be leveraged as part of a comprehensive employment initiative some descriptive results. Even though about 60% of these youth are eligible for free or reduced lunch, you could see that 90% of them plan to graduate high school and get a college education, and 89% report being very well off or fairly well off. This underscores 
the idea that the reality of these youth's lives does not meet their aspirations, as well as a tendency to say, don't pathologize us. In other words, this is strong evidence of resiliency in this community, which is an important part of the story. I also see a lot of trauma that is intergenerational community and individualized trauma in this community. As you could see, up to 50% of the youth have seen someone shot, stabbed, or badly injured. 17% report having a family member laid off in the past year. One in three say problems at home prevent me from focusing on school. And one in four live with somebody who is addicted to drugs. There is huge evidence of post-traumatic stress disorder in this community, as 68% of the youth say they cannot stop thinking about something bad that's happened to them. Now, in every focus group, I ask the youth, if you can change one thing about yourself, what would it be? And you could see the responses, general responses like, I want to care more about others, and I want to end my procrastinative nature. But importantly, there's huge evidence of anger, aggressiveness, and resentment in this community. And I started to think about this in relationship to the trauma that they face literally on a daily basis. So I have responses here like my aggressiveness. I get ex when I get aggressive, I want to hurt people. I spaz out real quick. My attitude, my anger, and negativity comes from life as I see it. I didn't think of solutions. My attitude has controlled my mind. And I want to underscore that these are 16 and 17 year old youth who are telling me these types of things. Importantly, these youth have, um, want to change their behavior. There's indication that, they're, that youth want to change, yet we seem to have this model where we tell people they could be and do anything that they want to be in this country and failing to realize that options are extremely limited. So, how did the jobs program help? Well, some, some of the youth told me that they just want people to hear their struggles and that it feels really good to get stuff off of their chest and vent. In other words, these youth want to feel empowered by institutional processes that are just not there for them. Why are youth jobs important? The first reason that youth jobs are important is because it increases life skills. 94% said that they learned at least one new skill as a result of their employment experience. When asked what skills they learned, the top responses were patience and problem solving. I learned to have more patience, how to become a problem solver, etc. How to communicate with others, leadership, and teamwork. And I think the most important point here is that the job provides a context where youth can become leaders of the community and see themselves as agents of social change particularly through a process of three-tiered mentoring where the youth not only have access to a mentor, but they are working with children in the community and they see themselves as a mentor for the younger kids who are struggling with many of the same issues that they are. The second reason is to provide family support. So many of the youth give their wages up to their families to support things like rent and help pay bills. Okay, and also, they, a lot of them told me that it helps cope better with family issues at home. So for example, I had issues at home and going to work to those things off my mind. This is a very familiar theme. The intervention found several statistically significant differences pre and post in risky and deviant behaviors, to name a few authority conflict, physical fighting behaviors, weapon carrying, and feeling sad because there was nothing to do. Again, all significantly related to youth violence and the reasons that these youth gave me for why youth commit crime. And probably most importantly, it provides a context for youth empowerment. So I'll just highlight two things here in terms of horizontal empowerment. We have academic persistence. As a result of my after school evaluation, I found that even though grades didn't improve, we found several statistically significant reductions in not going to class and unexcused absences, which only highlights the need for an employment program that begins early in the year and continues year-round that has a strong academic component. In terms of vertical empowerment, this summer I engaged in a, a community participatory research study where I hired youth to be research partners with me and we did research on youth violence in the community, and one of the highlights of not only my life but theirs was being invited to City Hall to present the research findings. 
Um, this opened up a conversation, which was very interesting. One gentleman in the audience said, well, if the violence in this community is so bad, why don't you just pick up and move? So um, apart from trying to restrain myself, <laughs> the youth handled the question beautifully and said, our parents don't have the money to get up and move. But the important point is that there were city officials in the audience asking questions of the youth. So they felt like they were having their voice heard and that somebody was going to do something to solve their problems. But that was all in the context of the youth employment experience. Okay. Um, what aspects are most effective? I'll just name a couple. Um, teaching problem-solving skills is clearly one. Mentoring, innovative teaching. It's important to establish trust. And vocational training and employment is obviously key. But the most important reason that youth need jobs is because it starts to get at the root causes of their trauma. Employment provides a context in which to understand and prevent trauma from violent victimization, social and economic trauma, by, for example, providing a mentor, by facilitating pro-social skills, and just the fact that they're earning money and able to support their families. So employment can be part of a comprehensive experience as long as negative socialization is replaced with positive ones, developing youth leaders through three-tiered mentoring, provides a highly structured environment, identifying and addressing problems occurring outside of school and work, and builds on youth's inherent resilience to deal with trauma from social isolation, economic vulnerability, and community-based violence. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Professor Barbosa. Our final speaker this morning or this afternoon is uh, Steve Tolman, President of the Massachusetts AFL-CIO. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And, um, I haven't seen many people leave another to run to the restroom, and I can tell you this, that I have learned so much being here this morning with all of the presenters. And it leads me to believe the conclusion early on that, yeah, we may be in trouble, but we're not dead. And yeah, we've got a lot of work to do, but hearing what I hear today, there is no doubt we can come out of this as a successful nation. And um, this is exciting, Governor. The caucus, as always, and, and for Barry for putting this together in Northeastern, I'm just delighted. And I'm going to kind of, it's, it's difficult to, because I'm a, I was a senator for the previous 13 years in, a, in the House for two terms prior to that, and I've only been the FLCIO president for a month. So I feel this, a little disingenuous saying I'm the FLCIO president because so much has been accomplished by so many of those that have come before me in the labor movement. But I will say this, that I do believe that everything we hear here today, and I know statistically, has a direct correlation to the decline of the labor movement, to the decline of our economy for our middle class. And I say and I pledge to all of you today that my goal and my most immediate intention is to turn that around because I believe it's the labor movement that stands for everything that's right in this country. And somehow we've been allowed, or we have allowed our detractors to demonize us, and that must change because we stand for everything that is right and everything that is wrong right here is a direct result of us losing clout, and we're on the road back, so let me begin from there. Thank you. And unemployment is stubbornly high. Wages and income are stagnant. Poverty is growing rapidly. The middle class is under attack. Homeowners are losing their homes in Washington is at gridlock. And there are so many ways I want to talk about Washington being at gridlock, but the biggest problem at all is almost seems to me that the Republicans want to see our president fail so that he doesn't get elected. And that, that, that is just so frustrating. The labor movement through its advocacy for workers everywhere, not just in its own members, has been a leader for decades in a movement to build a strong economy, raise family incomes, and reduce poverty and limit the economic and social inequality that so many have talked about today. And right now, our message is simple. We desperately need to create jobs in the United States of America. And, and Gia, you couldn't have said it better, especially for our youth. How we find ourselves in this current job crisis is well established, but worth repeating. 
the massive financial crisis caused largely by unethical, immoral, and reckless practices on Wall Street, which resulted in devastating job losses beginning in 2008. The job losses caused by the initial crisis started a vicious cycle of falling public revenues and consumer spending, which then begot more and more unemployment. I say very specifically that we are in a jobs crisis, not an economic crisis, because there is plenty of money in our economy right now. It's just not trickling down to the 99%. Overall, U.S. corporations right now have almost $2 trillion in cash on hand, and that's according to Moody's, a figure not seen in the last 50 years. And rather than sitting idle in corporate bank accounts, that money should be invested in jobs. During, thank you, during the 15-month period ending in 2010, corporate profits went up by $572 B billion. $572 billion. And during that same period, workers' wages went down by $122 billion. That 15-month period marked the first time in our nation's history that labor productivity gains were split 100% to 0% between corporate profits and workers' wages. In 2010, corporate profits as a share of the GDP reached the highest level in 60 years. Meanwhile, corporate taxes as a share of the GDP in 2010 were the lowest on record just above 1%. Hmm. While corporations have been doing well as of late, work and people have not feared, feared so well. Wages and salaries hit an all-time low as the share of the GDP in the 2008 have hovered there since. Our economy is just not working for the 99% right now, and we need to fix that. October's job numbers showed a lackluster job growth of 80,000 jobs overall, including the loss of 24,000 public sector jobs. We need to be doing more to create jobs for the unemployed and the underemployed. President Obama took an important first step and needed to take the step in introducing and fighting for the American Jobs Act. This common sense bill should have brought together both parties to stem the, stem the tide of this economic pain that is overwhelming American working people. Instead, congressional Republicans, including our Massachusetts Senator, have shown virtual unanimity in opposing job-creating legislation. They are placing partisan gain over economic security for working people. It's long past time for Congress to act and create the millions of jobs and put America back to work. We need solutions on scale with the problems of our economic, that our, that our economy faces. One of the simplest solutions to the jobs crisis is to make immediate investments and improve our infrastructure. It starts with building schools, roads, bridges, transits, transit ports, Railroads, communicating in, in, in energy systems worthy of a 21st century. Right now in Massachusetts, think of this, folks. Right now in Massachusetts, there are 50 unemployed construction workers for every available job. Many construction unions are seeing unemployment, unemployment levels at 40%. For blue-collar workers in Massachusetts and around the country, our economy is in a depression. At the same time, we have hundreds of structurally deficient bridges in Massachusetts, hundreds of road projects ready to get underway, hundreds of schools to be built and other public buildings in desperate need of repair. And all of this work 
needs to be all, and all of this work that needs to be done is just waiting in the wings because the state and city budgets are stretched so thin. The federal government must also help our cities and states not cut off their federal money and cause the public sector layoffs that drag our economy and threaten essential services to our communities. The American Jobs Act have saved and restored more than 400,000 public sector jobs, such as teachers and firefighters and paramedics and police officers. Jobs that are essential to the public but are threatened by strapped and local budgets. We must also help to solve the massive shortfall of consumer demand by raising the minimum wage and extending unemployment benefits and keeping homeowners in their homes. In the way, in the way we pay for it, as President Obama has proposed, is to restore the tax fairness. It's time for those of us who can best afford to pay their fair share to get America back on track. Congress must also pass the financial speculation tax, a well-designed tax on the financial transactions such as the sale and purchase of stocks, future options, and credit default swaps, which would raise hundreds of billions of dollars over the next 10-year period. Reckless Wall Street gambling has cost Americans trillions in lost wages, in savings, and in household wealth. It's time to put Wall Street to work rebuilding Main Street with the financial speculation tax to create jobs, rein in speculation, and lay the groundwork for a long-term economic prosperity plan. We cannot pursue the extreme agenda put forward by some in Congress to slash government spending and cripple essential government services that the agenda has cost millions of good jobs and continues to threaten all the tools that we have to turn this economy around. Now that we have established the cause of the crisis and some common sense solutions, let's talk about what did not cause a job crisis, despite what some Republican governors may say. There is no relationship between states with workers who have collective bargaining rights and states with big deficits. Some states that deny their employees bargaining rights, Nevada, North Carolina, and Arizona, for example, are running giant deficits of more than 30% of their spending. Many that give employees bargaining rights, like Massachusetts, New Mexico, and Montana, have much smaller deficits that balance out at about 10% despite the facts that the right wing continually trots out the same tired argument that firefighters and teachers and social workers are to blame because they know that working people fighting amongst themselves serve their own interests, but working people are starting to reject that foolishness. Unions are not the problem. We are part of the solution. And voters in Ohio proved that this week that they do not buy into the right-wing, union-blaming, union-busting attitude that is prevailing in many states across America. By a 20-point margin, the voters spoke loudly and clearly in Ohio and said enough is enough. They want to go to work. We need, as a middle class, to start working together. We need, as a middle class, to start rejecting the arguments that want to pit us against each other. And most importantly, we need as a working class to embrace the labor movement because it is everything that is right about America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me in thanking the distinguished panel for all of the information, the insights they gave us today. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I'll, I'll take care of it. Mm -hmm.